monitors are here. The new monitors are here. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today in Dave's garage, we're going to be taking a look at the brand new Dell UltraSharp U4025WQ, a 40-inch curved 5K120 HDR monitor, a display that might truly be the red wiggler of desktops. Wait, isn't that like two WKRP references in back-to-back -back episodes? Well, either way, you should know this is not a sponsored episode, and Dell had no input into anything I had to say about the monitor, both good and bad, and they didn't get to see this in advance. Now, you may not know this about me, but I'm a monitor snob, and that's been true for a very long time. In the same way that some of those crazy folks think that tube amps sound better because they inject warm distortion or that vinyl reproduces important inaudible harmonics, I care about things like pixel pitch and response time. Even going back to the late 1970s, I preferred the crisp green display of the Commodore PET to the blurry composite vision of the TRS-80, and the best display that I ever saw in the 80s was in an IBM data center. What seemed to me like an enormous bright orange plasma monitor, about 40 inches it seemed, for keeping track of the mainframe. It was unobtainable to regular people even at that time, of course. I paid my dues on a Commodore 64 connected via an RF modulator to my brother and my 13-inch Zenith color TV. Eventually, I'd get a 1702 monitor, which was a major step up. In my Amiga days, I started out with a good RGB monitor, something like the 1902. But the Amiga also had an odd interlaced video mode that ran at double the vertical resolution. The only problem was the refresh rate, which was a brain-bending 15 Hz. That's almost impossible to look at, so Commodore released a monitor with a special long-persistence phosphor coating. That reduced the flicker to an almost bearable level, but it had the side effect that your mouse would leave a long trail wherever it went, and a ghost would follow windows as you dragged them around, for example. I eventually replaced that with a scan doubler module that also doubled the on-screen refresh rate. Fast forward a couple of years to my Microsoft days, and it turns out that I've been a multiple monitor guy longer than almost anybody out there, since I was part of the NT GUI team that was actually adding the multiple monitor support. From about the day that I went live in the internal daily builds, I scrounged up a second monitor and a VGA card so that I could dog food the new Multimon support. You see, unlike most of the other guys who were coming to Microsoft from an MS-DOS or mini computer background, because I was an Amiga user, I'd left the world of plain text editing behind me long ago. It also meant that I preferred working in an IDE rather than on the command line, and so I was an early adopter of Visual C++, and even helped them get that product running on the MIPS systems, mostly so that I could use it myself. The net effect was that, since I wasn't locked into a pure text display, for me, the bigger the monitor, the better. With a larger display, I could open up Visual C's call stack window and thread list and so on, and overall, it was just a better debugging experience. As the new guy, however, I was stuck with the same 14-inch monitor that had been handed down to me when I started there. For all its billions, Microsoft was surprisingly and perhaps admirably stingy back in the 1990s when it came to hardware, so I wasn't going to be able to simply requisition some big new monitor. That meant I had to be creative, or at least opportunistic. One day, I was walking through the hall and I spotted the Holy Grail, a huge 21-inch monitor with BNC scientific connectors sitting outside somebody's office next to parts from an old SGI workstation. Usually, when someone had hardware that they didn't need anymore, they'd set it outside in the hallway and our PC recycle folks would periodically come around and pick it up. I believe it looked something like this. Bring out your dead! <laughs> So I stopped in the office myself and inquired about the monitor, and sure enough, it didn't work, and I was welcome to it if I wanted it. And I did want it, but only if I could make it work. So I got it back to my office, and I played with it for a while, and there was no power to it anywhere, and so there was nothing obvious I could do to spot to fix it. So I called our PC repair group and opened a support ticket. The tech came by and confirmed that it was in fact dead and would need to be replaced. Now, they couldn't get that exact monitor, he said, because it was probably an SGI thing, so they substituted a 21-inch NEC multisync instead. Now, in case you're not quite old enough, that big old NEC was pretty much the king of desktop displays back in the CRT days. I don't think there was any better, and I had just semi-scammed my way into one for my desk at work. For better or worse, though, it's one of those things that where you get used to it at work, it's hard to go home to your puny 15-inch monitor that Costco happened to have on sale. In fact, while I had fairly pedestrian computers at home, I was picky about my monitors. I liked the big NEC so much that I did some research and saved up and bought a pair of quite similar Sony Trinitrons for my den at home as well. There was a 21 and a 17, I believe, and the monitors were so physically big and especially deep that I had to cut a window in the back of my hutch to accommodate the yokes poking through. 
and those would be the last new CRT-based monitors that I'd ever buy. As a few years later, I'd invest in my first pair of Samsung 17-inch LCD displays. And a few years after that, I would upgrade to dual 21-inch monitors, still in the 4x3 format. Now, that dual monitor setup would ultimately turn out to be the last multi-mon setup that I would have, but it would last me many years. One of those monitors can still be found in one of my main cabinets, so they're still in use today. It was almost 10 years ago now that I took a chance and ordered a 34-inch curved display, hoping I could leave the two monitors behind for one really big one. I was a little trepidatious about going to a curved display. I remember curved TVs and 3D TV coming and going as a brief fad, and I wasn't sure if I wanted one for the desktop. But upon seeing similarly sized monitors in both flat and curved, I think it's readily apparent in person that the curved just looks a lot better out at the edges and in the corners. For curved monitors, the curve radius is usually denoted in millimeters and describes the radius of the circle that the curve would create if extended to form a complete circle. And the curve on the Dell UltraSharps is pretty subtle, normally within a radius of about 2 meters or more than 6 feet. Now, gaming widescreens usually have a smaller radius and hence a lot more curve to them in order to increase the amount of immersion. But with a monitor like this, you're not really looking to be immersed in a virtual world so much as being commander of all that you survey, a vast landscape of pixels born ready for video editing, sound design, coding, and pretty much any other productivity workload that you can think of. The one I decided on back then was the Dell U3415W, which ran at a resolution of 3440 by 1440 giving a single desktop comparable in size to the two prior monitors. And the display was crisp and beautiful. It wasn't the first one I bought. I returned a couple of others before I settled on the Dell UltraSharp. And that's going to be an issue that we're going to run up against repeatedly here because there's no easy and subjective way to convey what the finer points of a monitor's display look like in a YouTube video. Perhaps the best subjective metrics that we can turn to, mostly because they're the ones that matter the most to me, are the display technology, the image brightness, and the pixel density. The 34-inch was an LED lit display with a contrast ratio of 1,000 to 1 and a maximum brightness of 300 nits. The pixel density is about 110 per inch, and for reference, Apple has often cited 110 per inch as the retina threshold where you can't distinguish individual pixels. Now, perhaps that's at the iPad's distance, but I'm a little dubious. I really think you want to be closer to 150 pixels per inch at the distance you would normally sit from a desktop monitor before you should start calling it retina quality. It was my first curved monitor and I loved it. It took no real time to get used to it and I don't think you should be worried if you're considering moving to a curved display either. The old Dell served me well enough that I even bought a second one for another machine a year or two later. And when you've had a couple of years to use and think about a purchase and yet you still find yourself buying the same one all over again, I think that's high praise for the product and the Dell UltraSharp was no exception. About three years after that, I decided to upgrade to a full 4K monitor and I went with the Dell UltraSharp 3818DW which is actually 21 by 9 in ultra-wide format, and so the resolution winds up at 3840 by 1600 rather than the full 2160 tall that it would be if it were just 16 by 9 aspect ratio. The curvature is somewhat flatter, coming in at 2300R. The 38-inch version has a maximum brightness of 350 nits, up from 300, and the same 1000 to 1 contrast ratio, as it uses generally the same LED backlit display technology. Perhaps the best feature of this monitor, at least for my purposes, is that it features a 3-input KVM. So rather than connecting your mouse and keyboard to your computer, you connect them directly to the USB ports on the monitor. Then you run a separate USB cable and an HDMI cable to one computer, and a USB cable and a DisplayPort cable to another computer, and you can easily switch between them. And whichever source you have active connects your monitor and keyboard to that computer automatically. So this allows me to go back and forth between the Mac and the PC all day with a touch of a button. And better yet, there's a third USB-C cable input where I can plug my MacBook in, and when I select that input, the monitor is then connected as the laptop display, and the desktop's keyboard and mouse become active on the laptop. It even charges the laptop at 100 watts. It effectively allows you to switch between three sources, as long as you have exactly one HDMI, one DisplayPort, and one USB-C. One of the more interesting things that I discovered worked was when I plugged my iPad Pro in to charge off the cable. The iPad's display popped up on the monitor and the keyboard and mouse were connected to the iPad, complete with a mouse cursor, which I had never seen on an iPad before. The monitor's pixel density is close to that of the 34-inch, coming in at about 116 pixels per inch. And as good as this monitor is, that's its only downfall. At 38 inches, the pixels are just big enough that at 4K resolution you can still make out some individual pixelization. It's right on the cusp of being fine enough, but it's not quite there. 
If it had been just a little finer, I'd probably still be using both the 3818DW and the 3821DW that I added three years later. But I really needed and wanted something with higher pixel density, faster refresh rates, and ideally HDR. As far as I could see, however, there just weren't that many options. Now, the Mac Pro Display XDR is very nice with a 6K display at 218 pixels per inch. It has a million to one contrast ratio and a max brightness of 500 nits in SDR and 1000 nits sustained in HDR. It uses a 2D grid backlighting system with 576 local dimming zones. There could be more, but it's not bad. The color accuracy, though, is among the best in the world if that matters to you and what you do. By the time you get a stand and anti glare coating, however, you're looking at about $7,000. I'm sure there are folks out there for whom this monitor is perfect, but it's just outside my price range for what I do with it. Plus, I prefer 21 by 9 and this one's only 60 hertz, which discourages me from considering widening my price range to include it. The Apple Studio display is more reasonable at 2300 with anti-glare in a stand, but it's only 27 inches, and I'm not really interested in downsizing. I think 38 to 40 inches is the perfect size for things like Final Cut, coding, and so on. Plus, it still does not support higher refresh rates, as far as I can tell. I don't know if there's a practical benefit to having more than 120 Hz, but I know the jump from 60 to 120 is pretty noticeable. So my next monitor had to have at least 120. So far as I was aware, though, nobody yet produced my dream monitor. A high DPI, 5 or 6K display in 21 by 9 aspect ratio and around 38 to 40 inches with high refresh and HDR. And then, during CES this year, a secretive Mr. Sobeski sent me a link to a press release from a Dell about their new UltraSharp 40-inch that promised all that and more. The specs are impressive, so here's a summary. It's a 40-inch monitor with a 5K resolution and a fast 120Hz refresh rate on an ultra-wide WUHD screen. The contrast ratio is now 2000 to 1, and the monitor is Visa Display HDR 600 certified. In addition to its display chops, it supports the ability to connect to multiple computers at once, both for display and input, like the previous models. In a compromise, because of the adoption of Thunderbolt, that is probably the only thing I'm not really excited about this year, you're limited to effectively two computers connected to the KVM at any one time, rather than three. It's a feature that I rarely took advantage of when I had it, but I kind of hate to lose it. As soon as I heard the specs, though, I knew I wanted one and to get my hands on one and test drive it. And I know that I'm not waiting until March so that I have to go down and fight it out with the other geeks at Best Buy like a bunch of crazed parents buying Cabbage Patch dolls back in the 80s. So I did what you do if you have a YouTube channel. I called Dell six weeks ago to see if they could arrange for an evaluation unit. And so I've had the monitor for about a month now and have been daily driving it exclusively since this one, editing all my videos on it, doing all my writing on it and everything, all my coding, everything I do. The Dell supports 5K 120Hz on any of the inputs, be it Thunderbolt or DisplayPort or even HDMI, since the port is now HDMI 2.1 compatible, and that's important. That means I was able to plug it into the new M2 Mac Pro via HDMI and still get the full 120Hz refresh rate at 5K, something not possible with older versions of HDMI. I connected the Threadripper PC to the DisplayPort input and ran the KVM wizard in the monitor's on-screen user interface. Speaking of which, the on-screen UI isn't an iOS experience or anything, but it's surprisingly not terrible for one embedded into a monitor. Normally, the UI built into things like this makes me want to push chopsticks into my ears, but this one isn't bad. It makes it fairly quick to switch inputs, turn HDR off and on, and so on. You can also set up hotkeys so that your favorite inputs require just a single click of the monitor's joystick. And speaking of convenient features, there's also a handy pop-down port panel with two 10 gigabit USB-C ports and a USB 3 port as well. At least it gives you somewhere convenient to insert a USB stick if you own a Mac. Remember that both the PC and the Mac are each connected to the monitor by their own USB host cable, but only the one corresponding to the current display is activated. And whichever line is active is then connected to four USB-A 10 gigabit downstream ports underneath the monitor where you connect your mouse, keyboard, and other peripherals. For fun, I chose to plug a 16-port powered USB hub into the monitor, and then I connected my webcam and pretty much everything I could find to the hub, and it all switched back and forth seamlessly. Whatever is plugged into the hub is also dynamically switched by the monitor's KVM to connect to the active computer through the hub. The monitor even has a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port, which will show up as a network adapter for any computer that's connected to the monitor by USB-C or by Thunderbolt 4. It's not a feature I'm using myself, but it would avoid the need to switch if you had two computers and a single wall jack, for example, or if you only wanted one on the net at a time for some reason. 
The Thunderbolt 4 port provides up to 140 watts of charging power using the monitor's internal power supply, and there's no big external brick to contend with. There's also a Thunderbolt out port so that you can daisy chain the monitor in line with other Thunderbolt devices if needed. So if you had a RAID cage or similar, you could plug the monitor into the Mac and then the cage into the monitor, all in that one port. The Thunderbolt example that Dell would most like you to try, I'm sure, is two of these monitors in a daisy chain configuration. Dual 5120 by 2160 displays on a single Thunderbolt cable chain. Can you imagine two of these monsters side by side? At least you wouldn't have to pick between widescreen and multimon. But Dell didn't send me two, so I get to imagine just like you. As for color accuracy, I'm no expert, so let me just wow you with the hard specs. sRGB at BT709 comes in at 100% accurate, and DCI-P3 and Display-P3 come in at 99%. The color calibration accuracy has an average delta E of under 2. The chroma drift is less than 3 parsecs, and the Q-factor has a beta of 0.2, giving it a perfectly chromulent display. Now, if you're a gamer, number one thing you like to care about is response time. In terms of a full gray to gray test, it's a speedy 5 milliseconds in the fast mode and 8 milliseconds when in normal productivity mode. 5 milliseconds is pretty much ideal for gaming and you don't generally find that many faster. The monitor works equally well on both the PC and the Mac. Note that you need at least an M2 Mac to get 120 Hz. My old M1 just can't do it. And on the PC, your video card must be able to handle it too. But both my Mac and the 4080 powered PC easily drive the monitor at 5K120 and I didn't have to do any configuration or install anything to get it to work. I just hooked it up to the monitor with the cables supplied. You normally do have to turn on the HDR setting both in the monitor and in the display applet before you'll see high dynamic range. Dell provides software on both the PC and the Mac called Display Manager that helps you manage some of the monitor's more esoteric features like picture-in-picture -picture and KVM switching. Unfortunately, I found the software fairly unreliable. I was never able to get it to work to the point that I could have a hotkey that would be on both computers that would toggle me over to the other display. Doesn't seem like rocket science, but I had no luck. I really wish they had just looked for a keyboard scan code and implemented the hotkey by snooping on the keyboard that you actually plug in. Maybe that's harder to do than I think, I don't know. While I'm at it, it'd be super clever if their desktop software switched the display when your mouse hit the far right side of the screen. That way you could mouse your way all the way to the other computer. I'd pay money for that if it were done right, but the market of people who run both a PC and a Mac connected to a Dell monitor might be pretty niche. Now, as soon as you start running higher DPI displays, one thing you need to keep in mind is that you have to introduce scaling at the operating system level, or otherwise the user interface becomes impossibly small. That's because Windows, and probably the Mac, were designed for 96 DPI displays, and so if you are running 155 points per inch display, you'll likely be scaling the UI up by at least 125 or 150% to make it usable. On the PC, it's a simple change in display settings where you pick your percentage from a list. On the Mac, it's a little weirder. You wind up selecting a resolution lower than what your monitor is capable of, but it still drives the monitor at the native resolution while then drawing the UI at the lower resolution, thereby scaling it to the display. It took me a while to figure out that I wasn't really running my new 5K monitor at only 4K, and I think the Windows config is a little easier to use for once, or at least it just made more sense to me. The monitor also features stereo 9-watt speakers, and there's a headphone jack so you can plug your headphones into the monitor and listen to whatever is being sent over the HDMI, for example. The Dell 4025 supports VRR, or Variable Refresh Rate, which is what you want for performance gaming. It essentially means that your monitor will present the new frame as soon as it is ready, regardless of the actual refresh rate, as long as it's not more often than 120, which will be the upper limit. It also supports DRR, or Dynamic Refresh Rate. That's a Windows feature designed to help improve the balance between power consumption and visual performance on devices that have compatible displays, like this one. Essentially, DRR allows the system to seamlessly adjust its refresh rate based on what you are doing with your PC. When you're just sitting there staring at your code and the mouse isn't moving, things can settle back to a lower refresh rate, which uses less power. As soon as you move the mouse or grab a window or interact with the UI in any other way, it ramps the display rate back up to maximum so that you get the best display quality without wasting power and heat in the meantime. For it to work, both your GPU and the monitor must support it. The HDR support is very cool. It's hard to convey how good it looks on an SDR monitor, but here are a couple of samples being played live on the monitor that I'll talk over so that you can get a sense of what I see when I use the display. If only a sense. It's an amazing monitor. I haven't gone through a full HDR workflow in Final Cut Pro since getting the display set up, but it's something I do plan to try shortly. 
Now, if you found any of today's episode to be interesting or entertaining, remember that I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go. And if you're already a subscriber, thanks. Please consider turning on all notifications for my channel so that you don't miss an episode. And if once a week turns out to be too often, you can always just turn it off again. If you or someone you know may be on the autism spectrum, check out the free sample of my book on Amazon. It's everything I know about living your best life on the spectrum. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I'll see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.